Hey there, it's Steve from Serious Keto. And in this video, I'm gonna to continue to look at resistant starch. In particular, following up on my last video with tapioca starch and potato starch. It seems that whenever I do a video on resistant starch, it often leads me to more questions than it does answers. And certainly that was the case with the video I did about two months ago on tapioca starch and resistant tapioca starch. Since recording that video, which I will link to up here, I got a great comment from one of my viewers by the name of Rhonda Whitwer. She told me a lot about the whole resistant process and how it's done. She linked me to the patent article by the two people who developed this particular process of creating resistant starch. And I will link to that article down in the description below if you want to get all science geeky. But let me give you the gist of it. And I'm going to need to read this. So first off, this process was created in 1998 at Kansas State University by Paul Sieb and Kyung Su Wu. The patent has subsequently expired. So now any company, if they want to make resistant starch, they can use this process. The starches of the invention can be prepared from any type of starting starch. For example, wheat, corn, oat, rice, tapioca, mung bean, potato, or high amylose starches, and are preferably formed as a pos... Okay, now we're getting into words that I have a hard time with. Phosphorylated dye starch phosphodiesters. So basically they take the starches and they apply either STMP or STPP in the presence of sodium chloride to create a resistant starch. So as a result, we see these particular products, these resistant starches, showing up in keto products because they are not supposed to impact your blood glucose. Another thing that I found out subsequent to recording that video is pretty much every starch is resistant before it is heated. Once it is heated, it will start to gelatinize and then it ceases to become resistant. So when I drank that tapioca starch raw in a glass of water, that really doesn't tell us a whole lot. Subsequently, I also tested, again in a glass of water, Expandex from Modernist Pantry, that's another tapioca starch. I also had read that potato starch and even Bob's Red Mill potato flour were resistant. So I mixed each of those in a glass of water and choked those down. The potato flour was by far the most difficult to drink. That one actually induced a gag reflex in me, so never ever do that. In terms of the impact on my blood glucose using a continuous glucose monitor, I saw that both the Expandex tapioca starch and the Bob's Red Mill potato starch had zero effect on my blood glucose, which now we know should be expected. The potato flour, on the other hand, did have an impact on my blood glucose, raising it by 30 points. Now, to test this out properly, I hope, I'm going to apply heat to each of these resistant or supposedly resistant starches. First, the resistant starch that was provided to me from Modernist Pantry. Second, the tapioca starch that was provided to me from Modernist Pantry. And then Bob's Red Mill potato starch. I'm going to do this first in the simplest, easiest to consume application I can think of, which is just basically seeing if I can make a gravy out of it. I'm going to put some starch into some chicken broth, overheat, and we'll see what happens. We will take one cup of chicken stock, and to this I will add two tablespoons of the resistant tapioca starch. Whisk this in, and I will bring up the heat. We'll get this to a nice rolling boil, and as you can see, it is not gelatinizing. We'll pour this into a mug, and then do our glucose test. So now I'm going to use the level software to take a picture of this. And that will kick off the blood glucose timing for two hours. Oh, that's hot. Okay. Wow. Next time I'm going to take the temperature before I do that. Whoa. All right, it's cooled off now. It has gotten no thicker. So the resistant tapioca starch, no thickening, no gelatinization. There is a slight powderiness, for lack of a better word, 
in terms of the texture. The broth tastes a little bit more like a Campbell's chicken soup that had noodles in it, but doesn't have noodles in it anymore. So it could be interesting to see if this resistant starch could be made into some sort of a pasta. I don't know. All right, I will be back in two hours to see if this affected my blood glucose at all. It has been a little over two hours, so we will check our glucose with the continuous glucose monitor. And there was a spike. We'll open up the level software. And as you can see right over here, levels qualifies this as a big spike. I'll hit the analyze button and you can see my glucose went up 50 points. So I am surprised by this, but the reason you're not seeing a complete look of shock on my face is because around the one hour mark, I tested with both the level software as well as my Keto Mojo. And at the time, the Keto Mojo was showing a pretty decent spike as well. Two hours later though, I am back to my baseline. I'm back right around 100. Now I'm gonna test the other tapioca starch, the Expandex, in the exact same way. As before, we will start with one cup of chicken stock, two tablespoons of the Expandex, and I will whisk this together before bringing up the heat. Now we'll bring it up to a boil, and you can see it's already starting to gelatinize. And by the time I get to a rolling boil, it's thick, like coat a spoon sort of thick. In fact, I'll drag my finger across just so you can see how thick this is. Into a mug, and time for our glucose test. As with the supposedly resistant tapioca starch, I will also be taking a picture of this with the level software to mark the start of this glucose test. Unlike that last test, I did take a temperature reading on this, let it cool down before I started drinking it. That's a lot like just drinking chicken gravy right there. It doesn't have the powdery texture that the resistant starch did. It's actually very smooth on the palate. I thought it was gonna be kind of gross, you know, like drinking a glass of mucus or something, but it's, it's really like drinking sort of a smooth gravy. It doesn't have that xanthan gum, somewhat slimy texture to it. Yeah, I'm hoping that this works out because this could be a really nice chicken gravy right here. But I'm going to finish this mug of gravy, and then I'll be back in two hours with the results. It has been a little over two hours, so let's do our glucose scan. We're in a good place right now, 94, but let's see how much we spiked. Interestingly, the Expandex, which is not a resistant starch, got a lower spike, only a modest spike. And if we hit analyze, we can see that the glucose change was 26. So usually I call a spike 30 or more. This is kind of interesting. Let's do a comparison between the two. First, relative. You can see that the white bar, that's the supposedly resistant starch, that went up a lot higher and it was a more prolonged spike. And if we go to absolute, you can see pretty similar. What I take away from this is that the supposedly resistant starch had a lot more of a sustained glucose impact. So as seems to be the case with every one of my resistant starch tests, I'm confused at this point. Not a lot is making sense to me, but I've tested on myself as much as I want to today. Tomorrow, I will test the Bob's Red Mill potato starch, which is supposedly resistant, who knows, and I will test the tapioca starch that was supposed to be resistant in a baking application to see what happens there. After those tests, I'll see if I've figured anything out, if I've got any sort of takeaways, or if I need to continue doing additional tests. It's been a week since I did those last tests. I'm now gonna continue with Bob's Red Mill potato starch, again doing the broth test. And as you can see, this really, really thickens up. I mean, way more than the tapioca starch. In fact, it is so thick, I'm gonna have to eat this with a spoon out of a bowl. But before I do that, I'm gonna take a quick snapshot of it to mark it in the level software. I cannot begin to tell you how unappealing this looks right here.
Yet honestly, not bad tasting. I thought this was going to be way more disgusting than it is. All right, I'm going to finish this, and in two hours, the level software will have a report for me to let me know how this affected my blood glucose. I am back with the potato starch results, the potato starch cooked in broth, and you can see here it gave me a moderate spike. We'll click on Analyze, and you can see that it took me up 39 points, so more than the regular tapioca starch, that Expandex that I tried, but less than the supposedly resistant tapioca starch. Now, I'm not surprised that it's more than the Expandex because it definitely thickened a lot more, definitely a lot more gelatin-like in texture, but I'm still confused about why the supposedly resistant starch is behaving the way it's behaving. If you recall, that drove my blood glucose up by 50 points. Now, the question is, was this just a freak reading or what? So I'm gonna try it again. Once again, I heated up the resistant tapioca starch in chicken broth, I brought it to a boil, and it did not gelatinize again. So we'll give this a second trial, and we'll go from there. I'll be back in two hours. It's been two hours, so let's do a glucose check. And import this into levels. So this time, the spike wasn't as high. It's a moderate spike. Hit analyze and see that it went up 33 points instead of 50. So better, but it's still a spike. So if we compare this to the first time that I tried the resistant starch, you can see right here, better, obviously. That white bar was the first trial, the green bar, the second trial. Now here is the second trial versus the expandex tapioca starch, so the one that doesn't claim to be resistant. And you can see, fairly similar, the white bar is the expandex. That came in at 26 points of glucose movement versus the 33, and you can see that it also declined faster. Anyhow, that's all the tests that I'm going to do today, because you can see right here my daily metabolic score kind of getting messed up by all this testing here. So at this point, there's really two more experiments that I want to do. I'm going to redo the Chaffel experiment from the first episode of this series, and I'm going to do it with both the resistant starch and with the expandex, and compare the two of them and what they do to my blood glucose. And we'll get that filmed in another day or two, I hope. Now, I'm not going to take you through the making of and eating of the two separate batches of chaffles that I made, but you can trust that I made one batch with the resistant tapioca starch and one batch with the expandex. Each batch contained two tablespoons of starch, and here are the results. First, we have the resistant tapioca starch, and you can see that it gave the score of seven, or a gentle rise. I moved 15 points. So, not all that significant. Next, we have the expandex chaffles. That had a slightly better response. It says stable response and only an 11 point movement in my glucose. If we do a comparison of the two, you can see that they peak fairly close to one another, though the resistant starch had a slightly more extended glucose impact. So the results from this experiment were not as clean cut as I was hoping, but I still have some takeaways. First off, it appears that pretty much any starch is resistant prior to cooking it. So if you want to consume resistant starch for its health benefits, and I will include a link from Healthline, it's a great article on resistant starch down below, some of the health benefits include that it feeds the healthy bacteria in your gut biome, it can improve insulin sensitivity, which is a good thing, and it can also lower blood sugar after a meal. So if you are consuming this raw, there appears to be no, at least for me, impact on blood glucose. And I suppose if you were to use one of these starches, whether it's tapioca starch, potato starch, whatever, to make like a bar or some sort of a fat bomb that's not cooked, that would probably be all right. The next takeaway involves using tapioca starch as a thickener. Is this a keto-friendly thickener? I don't know that I could say yes on that. I think it's possible 
given that I was using two tablespoons in a cup of broth, you would never use that much to thicken a pan sauce or a stir fry sauce. Probably you're more likely going to use, I don't know, maybe half a tablespoon made up into a slurry. And even then, that's going to be divided probably between two, three, four people. So perhaps the impact of using this as a thickener is negligible. Finally, in terms of using the tapioca starch in baking, this appears to maybe be okay, at least in terms of the way my blood sugar responded. Now, how much of that was caused by baking, how much of it is resistance in the starch, or how much of it is just what we saw in all the other resistant starch experiments that I've done, where the fat from the cheese and the egg blunted the glucose response. One other interesting thing that's happened over the course of the couple weeks that I've been filming this is I have gotten a couple of messages from people that have used those little tapioca pearls in their tea. I think they're called like boba. And both of these people told me that they tried it and it had no impact on their blood glucose. So make of that what you will. So now having done six videos on resistant starch and its effect on my blood glucose, I have to say that it's not lived up to expectations. Certainly it's been billed as this miraculous process that isn't gonna move your blood sugar at all and is completely keto friendly. And that just hasn't been what I've experienced. And ultimately, I guess it comes down to something that I say every time I do one of these videos, is different people are going to react differently to the things they put in their mouth. And whether you're testing with a continuous glucose monitor, like the level system that I use, or a blood glucose monitor like the Keto Mojo or any other brand. I really, I'm brand agnostic. I just believe that people should test themselves, see how they react to different products. If you see a product that has resistant tapioca starch listed as an ingredient, I think it's safe to try, but make sure you check your glucose. If you found this video helpful, interesting, informative, click that like button for me. And thanks for watching.